Hi, it's Dwyer. It is Saturday, October the 5th, 2019. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk boxing, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, in fighting, in handicapping fights, it's not always about the opponent, right? Sometimes your own fighter has uncertainty, we'll call it, all around him that you need to pay close attention to, that dare I say might actually have you taking his opponent because the situation around him is uncertain and the public doesn't fully appreciate it. Now let's talk about Triple G, Golovkin. I want to be clear on this. In this era where you have people like Canelo out there, right? Other champions, Jamal Charlo. Champions, great fighters who have spanned several divisions, right? Terence Crawford. Lomachenko. Understand there are very few guys who you could look at and say this guy is one of the best champions in the history of his division. Now, I personally believe that Golovkin is one of the best middleweights ever. Right? For me, the holy grail of middleweights would be Carlos Monzon, the middleweight who was champion when I was a little boy. Right? I remember him. He was dominant. Marvelous Marvin Hagler, who owned most of the 1980s at middleweight. And Bernard Hopkins. Right? Hopkins had a several year run as the king of the weight class. Right? I know old timers will say, what about Stanley Ketchell? We'll mention him too. After all, he did drop heavyweight champion Jack Johnson. Died prematurely. But understand, Golovkin, in my opinion, belongs on that list with those men. I want people to realize that Ray Robinson's greatness was really at welterweight, not at middleweight. Some other guys, Gene Fulmer, right? Carmen Basilio, <clears throat> really weren't champions long enough to warrant consideration for being on this list, right? Much more so than even the pound for pound guys. Just understand that. Golovkin is a historical figure. Let me say too, just like the Hopkins Jermaine Taylor fights did not diminish Hopkins' star because there's a group of people out there who believe that Hopkins got robbed. Just like Marvin Hagler's fight against Ray Leonard that ended his reign did not diminish his legacy because there's a group out there who feel that Hagler got robbed. So too, in Golovkin's case, his alleged loss to Canelo, if you believe the storyline, it's a razor thin loss. Right? That does not diminish Golovkin. Because there are many people out there who believe Golovkin beat Canelo both times. Right? The draw and the decision. So Golovkin's historical. Right? In a way, very few fighters are. Right? Lomachenko is moving through weight classes. You can't look at Lomachenko and say, you know what? He is one of the absolute best lightweight champions in history. You could do that with this man, 
Golovkin, in my opinion, especially given his string of KOs, in title defenses, look it up, is one of the best middleweights in history. In my opinion, he's in rarefied air. Now that said, if you're betting on his next fight, understand that's a bet on the future, not the past. As much as I, and I'm one of those people who believes Golovkin beat Canelo twice, as much as I admire Golovkin's work, as much as I believe he's an all-time great, there's no way, none, that I would make him a minus 500 favorite. I guess the line's dropping. Now a minus 450 favorite over Derevianchenko at this stage of his career. Let's talk about the reasons why, now that the sirens fortuitously have started sounding in the background. Understand, I never saw Golovkin lose a fight with Abel Sanchez in his corner. I'm just talking about my point of view. Never. Right? Golovkin was perfect. It wasn't until the last few fights that you noticed Danny Jacobs and Canelo were able to take him the distance. So understand, the tide started turning on Golovkin before he leaves Abel Sanchez. Even though I think that Golovkin beat Canelo twice, right? There is no question that Canelo went the distance twice with Golovkin. None. Now Canelo's a great fighter, but, but, I was surprised that Canelo went the distance with Golovkin the first fight, much less the second fight. The first fight's disturbing because Golovkin has that fight well in hand, well in hand. Then you get to the midway point of the ninth round and something happens. Canelo starts to take over, doesn't he? I thought Golovkin won that fight, but Canelo was the fighter who finished strong the first fight. Right? That first fight, you know, it starts evenly, then Golovkin takes over. But then, Golovkin fades toward the end of the first fight. As Father Time entered the room. So now, Golovkin has a new trainer, Uncertainty. Jonathan Banks is a great guy, obviously he's worked with Vladimir Klitschko. He's been with superstar fighters before, he's had big wins as a trainer. I'm not doubting his capability, but it's different now, isn't it? Right, you have a different guy in Golovkin's corner. Now what I really don't like is that after the layoff, and let's face it, first loss of Golovkin's career, he took time off, right? He comes back. Why is the comeback fight at a catchway? That Steve Rolls fight was not at 160, folks. It was at 164. Was losing weight that hard for Golovkin at this stage of his career? Long-time viewers know, I question weight cutters anyway. I actually prefer guys who are right around weight all the time. Floyd Mayweather, Bernard Hopkins, right? Here, you have a situation where Golovkin, in his 30s, is having problems making it back down to 160. You don't have to be the guy spying on Golovkin's scale to figure it out. All you have to do is pay attention to the weight limits of his fights. 
So he comes back after a layoff. And he fights at 164. Now in the Steve Rolls fight, Golovkin, who was never the same on his back foot as he is on his front foot, as he is patiently stalking you, Golovkin is caught on his back foot. Steve Rolls gets off one of the best punches I've seen against Golovkin in any fight. With Golovkin backing up, Golovkin gets hit flush in the face. You notice that backing up, Golovkin is not defensively blessed, at least not now. At 36, 37. He's 37 today, right? Well, I'll just say, I didn't like how Steve Rolls, who was not ranked in the top 10, I didn't like how Steve Rolls was able to back up Golovkin. The fight's a short, excuse me, the fight's a short fight. But Steve Rolls has his moments. Golovkin looks unsure of himself. Right? It seems like they're giving Golovkin new skills. Now I'm all for learning. Right? I believe college never stops or high school never stops. Right? You're always in school. I'm all for learning. I'm all for learning new skills. But Golovkin seemed unsure of himself to me in the middle of that Steve Rolls fight. Well, let me just say, you look at Golovkin now, 37. Sooner or later, Father Time's going to catch up to all of us. 37 at middleweight. Folks, that's older. That's older. New trainer with skills he hasn't quite mastered. Right? Golovkin is really a guy who's a power puncher. Golovkin is a guy who comes up and who throws punches at odd angles. Right? Think the Marco Antonio Rubio fight. Look at the Steve Rolls fight, some of the punches Golovkin's trying to land. Golovkin is very heavy handed with both hands, but he can be outboxed for stretches by very technical types. Go back to his amateur career and look at his fight against Lucy and Butte. You don't even have to go back that far. If you want to see a technical guy giving Golovkin problems, look at the middle rounds, the second and third round, of his fight against Steve Rolls. Well, now he's fighting a guy who's had over 400 amateur fights. A guy whose nickname is the technician. Right? A guy who has a trainer, Andre Rosier, who actually has had a guy fight Golovkin. Give Golovkin one of his toughest fights already. Danny Jacobs. Right? Understand, Rosier trains both Jacobs and Derevianchenko. Don't be fooled by the Jacobs Derevianchenko fight. Those were two guys who had sparred extensively with each other. There was no element of surprise in that fight. <clears throat> now as it was, the fight's razor close. You'll notice Jacobs had to back away from the pocket. Jacobs had to get on his back foot against his sparring mate. Right? Now, I'll just say, if Derevianchenko, who was 23-1 and one in the World Series of Boxing, right? Understand who else was in the World Series of Boxing at different weight classes. Uh, Usyk, Lomachenko, right? If you were from East Europe, that was the World Series. That quasi-amateur setup 
brought out some of the best boxers in the world. Derevyanchenko was one of the big names in that World Series of Boxing. Understand that if, style-wise, he's able to get Golovkin on his back foot like he got Danny Jacobs on his back foot, some weird things could happen. Right? Some very weird things could happen. <clears throat> Let me say, too, <clears throat> if you Google Derevyanchenko here online, and by the way, he's been boxing so long, this isn't a young 20-something kid, right? This is the bronze medal winner in the 2007 World Championships. If you Google Derevyanchenko, you'll notice that he's wanted to fight Golovkin for years. Years. So now, this is his big moment. Understand he has an excellent left hook, but he's very two-handed. That right hand is straight. It surprises guys. It didn't surprise Danny Jacobs for the simple reason that Danny Jacobs had sparred with him extensively. Right? Understand how important sparring is. Did you know that badass Joe Fraser, the man who was the man back in the day, just flatly refused to fight Kenny Norton for the simple reason that Kenny and he had sparred a lot. Right? Fraser never fights Norton. By the way, both guys end up with the heavyweight title. But Fraser never fights Norton. Right? The Revianchenko and Jacobs fought. Jacobs wins a split decision. Right? Not unanimous. That's the Revianchenko's loss. Let me say that the Revianchenko also does some things better than Golovkin. Right? I'm not saying he's better, but we're breaking down skills. He moves better than Golovkin. He is what I call a better athlete than Golovkin. Right? Derevyanchenko is a guy who's still driving at 70 miles an hour in the 10th, 11th, and 12th rounds. Golovkin, as we mentioned here, gets outworked by Canelo in those later rounds of their first fight. Derevyanchenko is the kind of technician, both of these guys are, who is hard to clinch. Right now that's important when you're fighting a guy who's 37, who might be a little bit uncomfortable on his back foot. I'm just telling you, if the dam breaks and Derevyanchenko gets Golovkin in trouble, number one, Golovkin might not have the survival skills, right? I would, again, direct people to the Kasim Uma fight. I know the Golovkin crowd's upset with me because I always mention that fight, right? But Golovkin had problems with Kasim Uma, who, like Derevyanchenko, was trying to collapse the pocket on him, right? Let me also say, too, that Derevyanchenko, this is important, is excellent inside because Golovkin is a bit of a donut, isn't he? You'll notice the guy landing the body shots in the rematch. And I thought Golovkin won this fight too. But the guy landing the body shots in the rematch was Saul Alvarez. It was Canelo. You notice that if he could get inside on Golovkin, avoid the big punches, avoid the shots to the head at awkward angles, Golovkin's body was there to be hit. You know who's an excellent body puncher? This guy, Derevyanchenko. So let me be clear here. I believe Golovkin is still one of the great fighters of our time. He has a chance to KO anyone at 160 pounds. But because he's 37, 
because Jacobs went the distance, Canelo goes the distance with him twice before the new trainer, before the catch weight, before the awkwardness in rounds two and three of the Steve Rolls fight. Because Golovkin is still shaking off the rust, because four rounds against Steve Rolls is not enough to convince me that Golovkin should be a minus 500 or minus 450 favorite against a guy whose only loss was a split decision loss to his world-class stablemate. The bet I'm recommending in this fight, which I think is far better than advertised, is to take the plus 333 or plus 315, depending on where you shop, underdog in the fight, to win. He's catching Golovkin at the right time. New trainer, first fight at 160 since the Canelo rematch last year. Right? Take the Revianchenko to win, hedge the play with Golovkin by KO. Now what I want people to realize is in terms of volume, if this fight goes the distance, Golovkin is going to have at least as hard a time winning on the scorecards as Danny Jacobs had. Jacobs escaped with a split decision. <laughs> escaped with a split decision. And this was a guy who knew Derevianchenko before round one started. Had been in the ring with him. If this fight goes the distance, Golovkin might lose it on the scorecards. As it is, Golovkin's going to have his hands full. And let's be real too. Golovkin KO'd Steve Rolls. Golovkin KO's most opponents. This is one of the heavy-handed guys of our time. Right? When you think Golovkin, you need to think about other guys who usually finish by finishing. Right? Deontay Wilder. <coughs> other KO experts. In a way. So, the bet I like is the underdog because the odds matter. It's the Revianchenko to win the fight. Hedged with Golovkin by KO. Right? That's how I see this one. I think it's a much better fight than advertised. I think the Revianchenko has a chance to make history. I think the Revianchenko is a world-class opponent. Let's shift gears. Let me just give some post-fight comments on David Benavides' victory over Anthony Durrell. Now first let me just say Benavides was a 10 to 1 favorite going in. He was a minus a thousand. Now anytime that you can shorten odds from a minus a thousand to a minus 300 or better, right? Which Benavides was by KO. Then you are ahead of the game. Rather than bet a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars to win one tenth of that. If it's a thousand, to win a hundred. If it's a hundred, you win ten. Rather than do that, why not bet thirty dollars to win ten? And with the money you're saving, take the other fighter who was going off at better than 5 to 1 odds. Understand you ended up with more if you took our advice, which was to take Durrell to win the fight, hedged with Benavides by KO. Benavides got the KO. I'll agree with those who want to argue that had the fight gone the distance, maybe Benavides wins a decision. But the fight didn't go the distance. Durrell was serious competition. That fight makes it into the eighth round. Your ticket that had Benavides by KO cashed. But let me just say this. Benavides, after the fight, called out Caleb Plant. 
If that fight's ever announced, I'll be on the plant side of that one. Let's talk about why. Benavides is a size guy at 168 pounds, right? He's six one and a half. He was several inches taller than Durrell. He stands a bit too upright. He doesn't move that well to me. At times, he can take a quick step forward, like let's say a center in basketball, and dole out big punches. I don't dispute that. But against a guy who can move, who can get him to move, against the guy who can create what I like to call a mobile pocket, I think Benavides could be badly outboxed. Let me also say too that in my opinion Durrell left this fight on the table. At the beginning of the first round when you saw the two guys in the ring next to each other, when you noticed that Durrell was much more fluid than him, that Benavides doesn't have Durrell's level of balance. Right? That Benavides is a bit stiff. When you saw the guys early on, you thought to yourself, okay, well, the odds makers had this one wrong. This is a competitive fight. I thought it was competitive. I thought Durrell looked great until he got the cut, which was terrible, right along his eyelid. I thought that changed things, right? I thought Durrell started to lunge a bit, started to get desperate. Durrell understood that he was at risk of the fight being stopped. Right? The cut, I know it didn't look like a Tyson Fury cut, but the placement of the cut was terrible. That cut heavily impacted the fight to me. Right? So I know the Benavides crowd has a fighter who's unbeaten, who just won back the title. Right? Won it back from a very crafty veteran whose only loss was to Badu Jack. Right? I applaud Benavides on the win. I'll give Benavides credit on the close. Right? Durrell's corner appears to have thrown in the towel. No question about it. But wow. Let me ask you. I'm just throwing it out to you two. I know Benavides hits hard. Benavides is definitely one of boxing's better body punchers. But do you feel comfortable with his level of foot speed? I just don't think the guy moves that well. Speaking of guys on their back foot, do you feel comfortable with the fact that Benavides really doesn't get on his back foot? Right now, that's work for Andy Ruiz, who's the heavyweight champion. Right? Some guys are able to make things work, but understand Andy Ruiz has much faster hands. Just objectively. Than David Benavides. Right? Andy's a combination puncher who's fluid. You don't you don't doubt Andy's fluidity. I doubt Benavides' fluidity. Benavides can bust off combinations at times that are kind of like rehearsed combinations. But he doesn't strike me as the most interactive guy. Right? So I look at 168. The water is deep. I take Billy Joe Saunders. If Billy is serious in training camp and isn't on diuretics, right? I take Billy Joe Saunders over Benavides. I'd certainly take Caleb Plant, who is quick twitch, much faster, I mean much faster hand speed than Benavides. And of course, Caleb Plant, in terms of fluidity, is one of the gold standards of the sport. Right, so let's see what happens at 168. Benavides did better than I thought he would. Don't get me wrong, my Benavides by KO Hedge held. I cashed that ticket. But he did do much better than I thought. 
Young guy, unbeaten record. But I'm a skeptic. Right as he wades into even more deeper water. Let's just say I'm not sure if he can beat Callum Smith. Some of the other guys he's calling out at 168. You know, it'd be interesting if Canelo beats Kovalev, then decides to return to 168 to take on Benavides. Right? I'm just telling you, tall guys who are size guys, who are too big for the weight class, who are relying on hitting you, right, up close, I believe they would have a problem with Saul Alvarez, right, because Saul Alvarez can be fluid. Saul Alvarez has his upper body and head on a swivel. Saul Alvarez is a body puncher who can hang with any body puncher. So just understand, Benavides has certainly proven himself. Right? He's a worthy, world-class opponent. I just feel against guys who can move. Caleb Plant. You know, Billy Joe Saunders. Against guys who can move, who would create a mobile pocket. I think he loses. That's how I see it. Obviously, with Benavides' heavy hands, I'll hedge every play with Benavides by KO. But let's just say, as I look at Benavides, right, as I look at all the voices around him who are saying, this is a great fighter, right, Sean Porter picked Benavides as a sparring partner for his fight against Errol Spence, right, and Porter did look inspired against Spence. Right, as I hear all the supporters of David Benavides, let's just say I'm thinking to myself, in the words of the immortal Lee Corso, I'm thinking, not so fast. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.